Hi everyone, um, I wanted to spend a little bit of time talking about some background to World War I. Most of this is um, not because it's a history class, but as you know, interpreting literature through the historical context is a really good lens to kind of understand what you're reading, especially in um, the kind of literature we're going to be looking at with the World War I poetry and then with Tolkien and with Lewis. So, to start, take a look at the dates. Uh, World War I was an, an interest, interesting war. The, the Brits really didn't think it was going to last that long, um, and yet it did. So, between 1914 and 1918, so this is the beginning of the 20th century, and we talked a little bit about how the different attitudes going into the 20th century uh, were going to shape what was to come, so that late Victorian period moving into the 20th century. Britain is considered kind of the world power, although that's beginning to shift. Um, the United States, after the Civil War in the mid-1800s, was able to build itself into this global power as well, and then uh, the United States participation in World War I for the last two years is something that also helps to solidify kind of that shift of who rules the world kind of thing. Um, Britain, remember, is this incredible empire that stretches around the world, is heavily industrialized, and while there is this um, kind of this background of peace, while there were some conflicts in the 1800s like the Boer War, uh, there really isn't a massive war that England is involved in during Victoria's reign. So there's this kind of splendid isolation, you know, that we're doing what Brits do. You know, we're, we're telling the world how to live, we're modeling it, and we are this sort of um, beacon for the rest of the world to understand and follow. Though, you know, we're not going to get involved in places where we don't need to be involved. If you think about the end of the Victorian period, on top of that, on top of this sort of isolation, the country itself is beginning to shift quite radically. So those cracks in the late Victorian era that we talked about, there's this decline in religious beliefs. We, we looked at how the Anglican Church was beginning to split um, into different factions, and then we have all these Protestant uh, denominations outside of the Anglican Church that are gaining um, speed. But then also with improvements in technology and science and um, the understanding of, of the world, mm -hmm. there's this questioning of whether religion should be the center of society or not. And so there are all these challenges to what is accepted in society and why can't something else be acceptable. Mm -hmm. So as there are more freedoms for women and there are these shifting gender roles and there's this... Um, kind of this, this cultural movement away from this classism that had really ruled England before this, uh, there's, there's quite a bit of mobility. If you're a woman, if you're a poor person, uh, if you're not born into the nobility, there's this uh, way that you're, you're moving around. And that's really challenging to a society. You know, a culture that is built on class or is built on one rigid way of doing things doesn't really handle it well when people begin to question those ways of doing things. So we have that fin de siècle attitude, this sort of split idea about where the world is going. On the one hand, there's great hope. Um, the scientific theories of Darwin were turned uh, to society in this sort of social Darwinism. And it, it basically was this theory that there, there is a way that society can grow and grow and grow and become more and more perfect. Um, it can evolve towards perfection. Really, social Darwinism was just used as a weapon to justify uh, political power. You know, we are the ones who can lead the society to perfection, not those other people. So um, while it is kind of a, a hopeful theology or, or ideology, um, it, it was also used to justify some pretty horrific things, like imperialism, you know, like the, the English empire spreading itself around the world. And so then there is this great uh, pessimism as well. There's this idea that um, the world as we understand it isn't uh, present anymore, so we've got this new way of doing things, 
who are we connected to geopolitically, who are we allied with, um, how do we begin to protect ourselves from enemies, and in literature we see this too as kind of challenging notions of reality. These realistic ways of writing start to kind of push back against some of the idealism of previous literature. Stephen Crane is an American, was an American poet, and his 1899 poem, so right at the turn of the 20th century, um, is an interesting example of this fin de siècle kind of pessimism. This is the entire poem, so super easy to read. It says, a man said to the universe, sir, I exist. However, replied the universe, the fact has not created in me a sense of obligation. So there's this. Uh, isolation and this gloom presented in this poem. There's this man, this individual, proclaiming his identity, proclaiming his existence, and the entire cosmos is basically shrugging its shoulders and saying, yes, yeah, so, uh, okay. And it's, it's this interesting removal of man from the center, uh, man as the most important. And that's an interesting question that a lot of our World War I literature is going to ask. So how did we get to World War I? Well, for a great period of time, um, you know, when Victoria was queen in England and then moving into the 20th century, there's this um, growing sense that the world is more and more connected. It's becoming more of a global society now that we have the technology and the um, manufacturing and the industry to sail around the world, to begin flying, to um, build these railroads that connect the world in these ways that it never really had been connected again. So Europe begins to connect their currencies to one another. It's not a shared currency quite yet like the euro is right now, but there is this tying of the economies together. So there's, um, and remember too, that in the beginning of the 20th century, most of the rulers in Europe are cousins. They are all grandchildren of Queen Victoria, um, including Kaiser Wilhelm II, the German Empire, uh, and the Russian Tsar, and of course then the King of England, who is, is king during World War I. Oops, sorry about that. Just kidding. So these alliances begin to form around Europe as they become more and more connected to one another. So as these empires and these countries be begin to connect, their economies and their cultures to each other, they start to form these alliances, which is very natural. Germany is this enormous um, empire. It had unified in 1871 and had just really powerful uh, leadership under Kaiser Wilhelm. The Austrian-Hungarian empire, also enormous. If you look at the size of those two empires in pink there on the map, they dominate a great majority of what we would call Europe today and uh, actually many different countries are represented within those two ginormous empires, present-day countries. So those two decided to form an alliance, and so there's this enormous portion of Europe that is allied together. So when they formed that alliance in 1879, France and Russia, so one to the east and one to the west, respond by also forming an alliance in 1892. So we have the dual alliance with Germany and Austria-Hungary and the dual entente with France, France and Russia. So we use a French word for that one because it's France. So this Germany-Austria alliance is now surrounded by uh, what they perceive as hostile powers. In 1900, Italy joins with the dual alliance. They, it joins up with Germany. Um, Italy itself is, is uh, not very united by this point. They're, they're still kind of figuring out who they are as a country. But they, they first join with the uh, dual alliance, which now becomes the triple alliance. So Germany, Austria, and Italy. And then in 1907, Britain joins France and Russia in the dual entente. So here's what the map then looked like um, by the beginning of World War I. So on the left... We have the Triple Alliance. Italy is going to later leave the Triple Alliance, um, but at the beginning of the war we have this Triple Alliance. And then on the right-hand side, the Triple Entente, 
surrounding that triple alliance. So by looking at this just kind of geopolitically, it seems a little um, obvious how war is going to break out. So as these countries begin to connect to one another, form these alliances, and then view the other countries as threats, there's a, a really clear sense of how war is going to break out. Remember that uh, new technology and new manufacturing is changing all facets of life. It radically changes military life. It moves the, the uh, warfare of the time to what we would recognize as modern warfare. Steel and iron production are allowing for navies to arm ships and to create these armored ships. We also have the beginning um, early tanks being used, early airplanes being used, and improved gunpowder and improved artillery increases the distance over which a battle can be fought. So we're moving away from hand-to-hand -hand combat, although there is some in World War I, and moving more towards this industrialized combat. So the, the weapons that are being used and the weapons that are being created by these groups of countries are these new kind of weapons. This is a very, very new kind of warfare. So some examples of the developments. These, this kind of battleship looks normal to us, you know, in our day and age, but the size of the guns, the size of the artillery and the shells being used and the armor plating around the ship itself and the way the ship is created with new steel and iron is brand new for this particular battle. We also have the first use of airplanes in warfare. It's not as influential as it will be later in World War II, but this is where we start to get the idea of dogfights, of these planes um, shooting at each other and chasing one another across the sky. Uh, planes dropping bombs is uh, beginning to be used here in World War I. We also see um, on the top right there the use of machine guns. The bottom right is this gun called Big Bertha, which was a German weapon. Those are German soldiers, you can tell by their helmets. Um, it was rolled around on railroad tracks, which the soldiers would lay in like real time. So they would lay several um, hundred feet of track and Big Bertha would move and then they would lay several hundred feet of track and Big Bertha would move. And so this enormous weapon increases the, the reach of the artillery. So by 1900, we have these alliances forming and the alliances themselves and the countries within them are kind of quietly arming themselves and spending um, millions of dollars to build up their army, to build up their naval powers, and to develop these new kinds of weapons. So 1900 rolls around and we've got these incredibly armed countries. It, it still is a, a peaceful time until June of 1914. Austria, Hungary, remember one of those enormous empires that's connected to Germany, is uh, shaken when their ruler, Franz Ferdinand, is assassinated by a Serbian. There's a lot of um, uh, racial and ethnic underpinnings to that that I won't get into. So Austria-Hungary declares war on Serbia in retaliation. Russia steps in and goes, hold up, I want to protect Serbia. So now we have the Triple Alliance, Austria-Hungary, against the Triple Entente. So France, Russia, and Britain. So now these huge blocks of power are poised to do battle against one another. Germany in defending um, Austria-Hungary basically begins to uh, expand at a rapid pace. So Germany begins to roll westward and take over these huge pieces of Europe invading Luxembourg, Belgium, and France. Great Britain then says, hold up, don't attack France, they're our ally, and so they get involved in the war. This is when Italy decides to switch sides. Italy understands where uh, greater power is, and they are promised land, uh, especially in the northern part of um, Italy, into the Alps, uh, if, they're, if they help with victory. So England is now in the war. 
they have formed this alliance with France and Russia, and when Germany and Austria-Hungary began to threaten Russia and France, England enters the war. This is um, kind of a per an interesting perfect storm because up to 1914, so in the Victorian era, when there really is no big warfare going on and building up into the 20th century, England kind of had this love affair with the idea of war, not the reality of war, the idea of war. And boys were raised during these generations leading up into World War I to think that death on a battlefield would be this glorious death. Universities and prep schools and kind of these Boy Scout groups perpetuate this idea. They use this kind of military structure and discipline to train men um, to grow into these soldiers, even though there's really nowhere to fight until 1914. Sports were used as prep for military. Um, pretty violent sports in, in some ways, like rugby um, and even football, uh, soccer, we would call it. And the, the kind of hazing to root out weakness and to celebrate strength. So a lot of the posters um, around England as the war begins in 1914 have this very gendered way of approaching boys and men. It defines who men are. And so there's a um, inherent definition of what it means to be manly and that manliness is to dream of this glorious death on the battlefield, to live this structured, rigid, rigid kind of disciplined life and to answer the call. And then gender was um, used, uh, the, the two genders are used against each other. There's this um, movement started as the war begins in 1914 to shame men who have not joined up uh, to the army or the navy. So a, an able-bodied young man walking the streets but he's not in a uniform would be approached mostly by women in this white feather movement they would hand a white feather to that man to shame him, basically to call him a coward. So this gendered idea of the women say go, the women will mock you and shame you if you don't, and then the idea of manhood. So this is taking this idea of you know separate spheres way far, like this exponential way. This, of course, is predicated on the idea that Britain thought this war was going to be simple. They are um, marching out in August 1914, and they think they're going to be home by Christmas. They don't foresee, none of Europe foresees the kind of war that this is going to be. They have no clue the devastation they're going to see with these new weapons. They have no idea of the, the level of violence that they are going to be exposed to because this is a mechanized war. Schools were feeding, they were basically a pipeline for uh, boys and young men to move into the military. Um, some of the propaganda, like this poster, appeals to legend and literature, the knights and fighting dragons. So most of the universities were basically emptied out. C.S. Lewis, Tolkien, Rupert Brooke, and Siegfried Sassoon were all from Oxford or Cambridge. The only World War II um, poet that we are reading that is not from a university was Wilfred Owen. Um, and it's not because he didn't want to be in university. He really, really did, but he could not afford it, and he was from a poorer um, family. So this new um, kind of war bumps up against the English idea of masculinity and that um, destruction of human life is something that shatters the idea of glorious death on the battlefield. This ideology of the, the heroic soldier dying on the battlefield is absolutely shattered by the reality of what this warfare looked like. It's trench warfare, it's hideous, it's ugly, it's muddy, it's filled with um, dead bodies. The, the trenches are where men lived and fought and died. So there's, there's human waste, there are um, dead comrades, 
and then you basically hunker down and wait until you're told to do something. So it's these long periods of living in filth, punctuated by these very short, very traumatic ways of fighting and, and battles. So the trench warfare is um, something new. You know, we're not meeting on a battlefield, one, one side lined up on one end of the field and then the other side lined up on the other end. It doesn't work that way anymore, uh, especially with this new artillery. So the only way you stay alive is to try to go underground. Um, I highly recommend the recent movie, 1917, uh, which is about World War I and England in World War I as a fantastic picture of what this trench warfare looked like. It's a pretty horrific thing. This is not a knight in shining armor, you know, going off to, to the battlefield. This is um, men being forced to live in the ground, basically like rats, and then forced into these battles with these mechanized industrial ways of doing war that they had never faced before. Biological warfare, so using gas um, and other biological agents were, uh, it, it, this is a new kind of warfare too. It's being used for the first time really in World War I on a large scale. So <clears throat> how to put on a gas mask, how to protect yourself from mustard gas and chlorine gas, which will uh, basically cause you to drown in your own um, fluids that fill up your lungs. So the, the equipment of war is changing as well in response to the new kinds of weapons that are being used. This is unprecedented trauma. And we see the World War I poets especially struggling with this. We see uh, Wilfred Owen, for example, calling it the old lie with a capital L. Like, how dare they tell us that this would have been glory? that this kind of fighting and this kind of lifestyle is something to be um, hoped for. That is a lie, according to Owen. This kind of um, extreme violence and extreme um, weaponry causes within the soldiers this, this enormous psychological and physical reaction. If you haven't watched the beginning, um, at least the beginning, of the documentary on shell shock, I really recommend doing that because it's going to help you interpret especially the poetry of Sassoon and Wilfred Owen. So this is a, a very literary war, which is very British, and this movement, this very modern kind of movement towards realism and naturalism is going to shift the way that um, literature and especially England are talking about this war. They are wrestling with this loss of innocence. They're wrestling with the loss of a, a past and this uh, sense of duty and this sense of country that just it really doesn't exist anymore. It's been destroyed by this kind of warfare that no one really anticipated. The first uh, World War I poet we're going to read is Rupert Brooke. He is an early World War I poet, and you'll see in his poetry it's still a little bit naive. He never sees um, warfare. He is in the army, but he dies uh, from a blood infection before he ever gets to a battlefield. Um, he's in the Mediterranean with his group of soldiers, and they're um, traveling towards Greece and Turkey but they, um, he, he dies before they get there. So his poetry is this really interesting look at the early version of World War I poetry when there was still this sort of naive, hopeful um, idea that the war is going to be glorious. Uh, he writes in one of his poems that if he should die and be buried in some faraway land, don't you worry, you know, know that that piece of land where I am buried will be forever England. You know, this very nationalistic, idealistic way of viewing the war. The second poet we're going to look at is Siegfried Sassoon, and he is very different. At the beginning of the war, he's, he's an amazing soldier. Everyone who serves with him and under him had glowing things to say, and he is, um, he racks up all of these different medals for his bravery on the field. Towards the end of the war, he is injured and he's sent back to the UK to uh, recuperate before he is put back on the front lines. And 
in that time, he's beginning to have this growing distrust of the government because this war is going on and on and on and on, and more and more people are being slaughtered. So while he is recovering at Craig Lockhart Hospital um, in Scotland, he actually meets Wilfred Owen and encourages him to write poetry. But when Sassoon is uh, judged fit to go back to war, at first he refuses, which is a court-martial um, action. He, he could be um, imprisoned for this and punished greatly for it. And he writes this interesting piece called A Soldier's Declaration. And let me show it to you really quickly. It is, uh, this is an interesting website, by the way, um, hosted by Brigham Young on all of the literature of the Great War. But this is Sassoon's protest. He doesn't want to go back to the war. And he says that I believe, starting here, this war, upon which I entered as a war of defense and liberation, has now become a war of aggression and conquest. He's telling basically the government and the army, you, you've done this bait and switch. You, you got us into this war as a war of defense. And now we're on offense and we're continuing this war and we're continuing this death for no reason other than to prove a, a, a massive point that we are the most powerful in the world. He is careful to say, I am not protesting against the military conduct of the war. He's very careful to recognize that the soldiers are not the ones to be blamed. He says, but I'm, I'm protesting against the political errors and the insincerities for which the fighting men are being sacrificed. So in his refusal to go back, there's this um, growing um, pushback against this idea of what war is and especially what the government's doing. He does survive the war. He eventually does go back to the front lines. And he survives the war. And his poetry is the, the beginnings of this darker kind of poetry. After the war, he does marry and have a family, um, even though he also had numerous uh, homosexual affairs, which, of course, were frowned upon in the time. Uh, he lives um, into the 1960s, which uh, C.S. Lewis also does. Wilfred Owen um, is the only one that does not come through one of the universities. He really wanted to. He was uh, passionate about it. He wanted to attend Oxford, but he just couldn't afford it. He, um, in some of his early years, was uh, becoming di very disenchanted with the church, with the Anglican church, that it wasn't serving the poor and it wasn't serving the needy the way that he thought the church should. So when he enters uh, the war and he enlists in 1915, he's already a little discontented with this idea of um, who England is and, and this sort of righteous sense that England had when it got into the war. In 1916, he's injured and he's um, sent back to England to recover. That's when he meets Siegfried Sassoon. And Sassoon and others encourage him to write poetry. Poetry was meant to in his healing, help him overcome the, the psychological traumas of shell shock. So he um, does finally become healthy and he's judged fit to return to the war and he is killed in action on November 4th, 1918, exactly one week before the end of the war, before the end of armistice. November 11th is when the war ended um, there was already this agreement on all sides that we're going to end this on November 11th. And so at 11 o'clock on the 11th day of the 11th month, so November 11th at 11 o'clock in the morning, the guns stop firing and the war is over. Um, Wilfred Owen missed it by one week. I have this personal interest in Wilfred Owen. And in fact, I have posted on Moodle with the World War I poetry um, a paper that I wrote about Wilfred Owen and his poem Dolce et Decorum Est uh, when I was in grad school. So recently, actually, I was taking some additional online graduate credits in literature. So I've posted that. I am interested in him, number one, because there is this interesting coincidence. This is my great, great uncle, Wiley Neal, um, from Tazewell, Virginia. And he fought in World War I and was killed on the same day that Wilfred Owen was killed. He also was killed one week before um, Armistice. 
And um, Wilfred Owen's poetry is an interesting uh, form of poetry too. We'll get to that. I'm also putting Tolkien and Lewis, as you know, Tol uh, J.R.R. Tolkien and C.S. Lewis into the World War I camp because they did fight in World War I. They did not write specifically about World War I like the poets did, but it's interesting to trace um, how they view the war in their writings. So in the ways that they portray battle, in the ways that they portray good and evil in their writings, that you can see the effect of World War I. Tolkien was actually born in South Africa. Um, his father died when Tolkien was very young, and he and his mother and brother moved back to England after his father's death. And then his mother died shortly thereafter from complications of diabetes. So Tolkien is 12 years old. Um, he has a brother, and he's basically orphaned. Uh, he's raised in this um, different successions of houses. There is a Catholic priest who is meant to take care of him and his brother. They are a very, very Catholic family. And um, he is, is housed in these different boarding houses where he is able to complete his education and then go study at Oxford. He was fascinated by language, and that's really what gets him into writing, is he began to create languages. He creates these different elvish languages and dwarven languages and languages of good and languages of evil. And that's really what gets him into literature is not really his love of writing, but his love of language, uh, philology, the, the love of language. He didn't immediately join the war. He wanted to stay at Oxford. Um, so he did. He finished his degree and then eventually joins up in 1916. He was on the front lines during the one of, one of the most um, horrific battles of World War I, and that's the Somme Offensive, when the, the allies of Britain and France are trying to push German, uh, Germany back uh, to the east and along this line in France called the Somme, uh, this river. And there's an um, enormous battle. Uh, Tolkien, though, is, is recognized as a great lieutenant, um, and he's promoted to lieutenant, but he, his body is ravaged by warfare, especially trench warfare. It's a horrible, infected place to be in a trench, and his um, body dealt with infections through the war and even after. He begins to think about his world of Middle Earth. Um, during World War I, he pretty soon after World War I publishes The Lost Tales, which is this very kind of backdrop, sort of legendary um, history to uh, Middle Earth. It's not till a little later that he begins to write uh, The Hobbit and then eventually the trilogy of The Lord of the Rings. So this is the sum, the battle that he was uh, part of. It lasted for four months. And on the first day of battle, 58,000 British men were lost, were killed. And this is where we start to see the, the tragedy of mechanized warfare. The very first time tanks are used um, is the Battle of the Somme. And the land in France is still scarred from this kind of warfare. You can still see um, craters and, and scars on the, the land from both World War I and World War II. Uh, Tolkien then does return to Oxford as a professor in Anglo-Saxon. He wants to um, surround himself with friendship. He, in his early years, he had this group of friends uh, before World War I. Um, and then when they came back, many of them had, had been killed. After the war, he wants to create that same sense of friendship and like-mindedness. So he, he forms this group called the Inklings, uh, which Lewis is involved with, as well as other British authors like Charles Williams and Owen Barfield. Lewis is Irish. Um, he's born in Belfast in Northern Ireland and uh, also has a brother, much like Tolkien, and they grow up in this, um, in this fascination with fantasy. They have these fantasy worlds where animals talk and they, they create all of these sorts of fantastical tales as a way of play and a way of uh, keeping themselves occupied. He did serve in World War I, and he was wounded pretty significantly at the Battle of Arras. He returns to Oxford after the war to finish his degree, so he finishes after the war. Tolkien finished before the war, and then he takes up a position as a professor 
of literature at Oxford, and that's when he meets Tolkien. One of the key things with the relationship between Lewis and Tolkien is the idea of faith. Uh, Tolkien maintained an incredibly strong Catholic faith all the way through the war. Lewis was raised um, Anglican. He was, you know, Northern Ireland. He's, he's raised basically British. And so very staunch Anglican family. However, before the war, he starts questioning his faith. And then the war basically destroys it. And so he comes out of World War I as an atheist. But when he meets Tolkien at Oxford and he joins this writing group, uh, that atheism is, is challenged. And so uh, by about uh, the, the late 1920s, he goes, all right, yeah, there's a God, this sort of theistic understanding of the world. And then finally, by the 1930s, he is brought back to his Christian faith that, yes, there is a God. And then the, the story of Jesus is the truth. And so he brings himself um, through Tolkien back to Christianity. And Tolkien really used this idea of myth of story that tells the truth um, to bring Lewis back to his faith. So as you read these poets and these writers, keep this context in mind. This is a cataclysm. This is an event that forever changes world history and it forever changes literature. And so that's how we are going to study um, the literature. And so let's do it. Keep scrolling down and let's do the literature.